Many Christians would be disturbed on much of what's being represented in the media concerning Israel. And there are churches who understand God's prophetic purposes for Israel, but there are also many who do not. We've pointed out before that Jesus has stated more than once the Jews must be back in Jerusalem for him to return. He said that in Matthew 23, 39, in Luke chapter 21, verse 24, and in Zechariah chapter 12, Jesus is actually speaking by the Holy Spirit in the first person, that the Jews would be in Jerusalem and look upon him who was crucified, pierced, and mourn as one mourns for an only son when he returns. But he says this will happen when the nations come against Israel and the Jews over Jerusalem. Jerusalem is where Satan got his biggest defeat, and the scripture tells us it's where he will get his final defeat. He must attempt to displace the Jews from Jerusalem. Replacement theology has been around since the early centuries of the church. It gained momentum when the church gentilized, particularly after the time when Constantine the Great, with a political ambition, made Christianity the religion of the Roman Empire, replacing scriptural Christianity with what we might call Christendom. There was an incipient anti-Semitism among some of the church fathers, such as John Chrysostom and others. This grew worse over the ages. Now, God is dealing with Israel and will continue to. Unbelieving Israel is under the curse of the law. Its ugly history and the torments suffered by the Jews for centuries are exactly fulfilling what the Torah said would happen in Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 28. If they rejected the Messiah, according to Moses in Deuteronomy 18, verse 18, there would be a requirement. They are under the curse of the law. When the second temple was destroyed in 70 AD in fulfillment of the predictions of Jesus and the prophecies of the Hebrew prophet Daniel, every Jew had one of two choices. They could realize the Messiah had come, or they could invent another Judaism that was not scriptural. Well, they made the wrong choice, apart from a faithful remnant. Daniel chapter 9 made it clear the Messiah had to come and die before the second temple would be destroyed. Replacement theology is not simply the issue of the church having replaced Israel, which is a doctrinal error in itself, or the denial that God has a prophetic purpose for Israel and the Jews, or the nation Israel. It's symptomatic of a fundamental misunderstanding of God's dealing with man. The validity of a covenant never depends on the faithfulness of man, but only on the faithfulness of God. Human infidelity is never an issue. He remains faithful and we are unfaithful. We are told even in their unbelief, Israel and the Jews remain beloved of God for the sake of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, according to St. Paul in Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11. Well, let's understand this further. I have never known a single Christian preacher, pastor, author, theologian who was wrong about Israel, who was not also wrong in their other theology. Israel is a kind of a litmus test that will be one of the key issues that will separate the harlot church from the true bride of Christ in the last days. The harlot church will, of course, embrace the Antichrist and follow the system of Babylon the Great. One of the dividing issues will be the place of Israel in prophecy, churches who recognize it as opposed to those who don't. It is a symptom of a much greater problem when you see replacement theology. If God does not have to keep his promise to Israel and the Jews, neither does he have to keep his promise to the church. The fact of the matter is, the church has no covenant. God never made a covenant with the church. Jeremiah 31, 31 states directly, I will make, literally, I will cut 
a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. The scriptures teach the new covenant would be made not with the church, but with Israel and the Jews. Paul confirms this in the book of Romans, chapter 9. He writes, to the Jews it belongs, present continuous active in the Greek text, still belongs, the covenants, plural, diatheki in Greek, diatheki. The old and the new covenant both belong to Israel. The new covenant was inaugurated by Christ at a Paschal Seder, a Seder meal, based on an ancient Near Eastern suzerainty ritual. God never made a covenant with the church. Non-Jews who accept Jesus are grafted in. But they don't replace Israel. The church never replaces Israel. Believing non-Jews replace Jews who don't believe. But the covenant is with the Jews. The root, Riza, in Greek, of the patriarchal promises. We have people teaching fundamental error concerning this, such as Nigel Wright in Great Britain. His theology is presuppositional, but it's packaged in impeccable Oxbridge English, yet it's asegetical. It has no basis in anything the scripture actually states inductively. What well, Paul says the Israel of God He's speaking about the faithful remnant of Israel, of the Jews of the Old Covenant who were faithful and the Jews who believe in Jesus and the New, the natural branches. There's no basis to say it's the church. Nigel Wright, just on the basis of his own mind and his own tradition, decides so. Now, he's an Anglican. The Church of England is ordaining homosexuals. The Church of England is in a moral theological freefall. At one time, when it had a strong evangelical presence, the Church of England was not like that. They were leading Anglicans. People like William Wilberforce and the Earl of Shaftesbury, who understood God's covenant purposes for Israel. But the turning away from it, represented by people like N.T. Wright, is emblematic and symptomatic of the decline of Anglicanism theologically. They don't understand. God cannot break his covenant promises to Israel, and the church has no covenant of its own. He simply makes it up as he goes along. He's very good at Sitzemleben. He understands the cultural background of the Gospels quite well. And again, he knows how to package his rhetoric in impeccable Oxbridge English. But what he says is not inductive, not exegetical. It's presuppositional. There's no support for his conclusions. None. In his dealings, he essentially seems to avoid Romans 9, 10, and 11, which is the heart of the New Testament's treatment of the relationship between Israel and the church. I do not suggest for one second that if somebody is right about Israel and understands God's prophetic agenda for Israel, that that means they're otherwise, as it were, kosher. There's a lunatic fringe of the messianic movement, lifting up Jewishness instead of Jesusness. People were trying to put Gentiles under the law, Sabbatarian legalists. A messianic version of essentially the same thing as Seventh-day Adventism. There are all kinds of people, a lunatic fringe, who have a fascination with Israel and the Jews in terms of biblical prophecy. Being right about Israel does not mean somebody is right in their other doctrine. But being wrong in Israel guarantees they're wrong in their other doctrine. I look at the late false teacher, John Stott. He was anti-Israel. Yet he wrote a book promoting annihilationism. We can't tell unsaved people that there's no eternal hell, said John Stott. He went down the ecumenical road. His other doctrine went off. Being wrong about Israel was simply another manifestation of the fact that he was wrong about a lot of things. And he's not the only one. I look at John Piper in America, another one, a cheerleader for Rick Warren. 
Rick Warren has a global peace plan saying that we have to unite with people who worship other gods to inaugurate global peace. Moses called other gods Shadim in Hebrew, demons. Paul called other gods the Manoi, demons, in the New Testament. Yet Rick Warren says we have to unite with Hindus, Muslims, Buddhists. We have to unite with people who worship what the scriptures call demons in order to bring in global peace. This is an antichrist agenda. Well, who is the cheerleader for Rick Warren in the American Midwest? It is John Piper. You can visit YouTube and watch John Piper leading the Lectio Divina, visualization and contemplative prayer with the hyper-charismatic woman who is from the lunatic fringe, Beth Moore. If they're wrong about Israel, we may rest assured they're wrong in their other doctrine. Now, the media, of course, has a bias. Satan must try to displace Israel. He must try to drive the Jews particularly out of Jerusalem. He won't succeed, but he's trying to preempt, prevent the return of Christ. And the media is more than willing to help him. Its bias against Christians is unspeakable, but its bias against Israel is co-equally unspeakable. I've explained before that Islam divides the world into Daram al-Islam, and Daram al Harb, the world of Islam and the world of the sword, that they must make jihad against the infidel. That is their claim to the Holy Land. It's based only on their doctrine of jihad. They are not the indigenous people, as we've explained previously on other recordings. What would you say of Hamas? It's listed by the American government, by the European Union, by the British government, and multiple other governments, including the government of Egypt as a terrorist organization. There are even moderate Muslims who realize what it is. Let us remember that more moderate Muslims who wanted peace, Anwar Sadat was assassinated by radical Muslims who are the Egyptian partners of Hamas. Hamas is simply the military arm of the Muslim Brotherhood, people who killed Anwar Sadat for wanting to make peace people who killed King Abdullah I of Jordan for wanting to make peace, people who murdered Benazir Bhutto in Pakistan for wanting to make peace, who murdered Robert Kennedy, Sirhan Sirhan, a Palestinian Arab, because he wanted to make peace. These people kill other Muslims to say nothing of what they do to Christians, such as Boko Haram, no different than Hamas in Nigeria, what's happened in Darfur, and what the Muslims do to each other in Syria and Iraq and Libya as we speak, to say nothing of what the Palestinian Arabs did to each other in the civil war between the Palestinian Authority and Hamas in Gaza. Let's understand why the people in Gaza are suffering. Untold stacks of money from Europe and the United States were poured into Gaza and the West Bank to build an infrastructure for a future Palestinian Arab Muslim state in addition to the one already existing in Jordan. That money was pilfered. It was embezzled by the followers of Yasser Arafat and by Arafat himself. The people in Gaza were driven into the arms of radicals like Hamas, who in turn took the aid and invested it into military infrastructure and weapons in collaboration with terrorists sponsoring Iran. They oppressed their own people. Hamas closed down the Christian bookshops and threatened the Christian population and imposed Sharia in Gaza. What happens to women's rights under Sharia? What happens to Christians' rights under Sharia? What happens to homosexuals and lesbians? Not that I agree with homosexuality and lesbianism, but under Sharia, their plight does not fare well. Yet the biased media faults Israel. Hamas routinely, in violation of international law, 
targets Israeli civilians indiscriminately and then uses their own civilians as human shields, firing rockets from populated areas so when the Israelis are forced to fire back in self-defense, the collateral damage inevitably kills civilians. Although the Israelis comply with international law, pre-leaflet warned people to flee, Hamas does not allow them to. They propagate the lie that there's an Israeli blockade of Gaza. This is also a nonsense. There's no blockade. There's an interdiction of arms coming from Iran. But they allow food, medical supplies, construction equipment. Unfortunately, the cement and construction equipment was diverted to build tunnels and military bunkers to attack Israel, not to help the people or build schools or hospitals as was designed and intended. You attack Israeli civilians and use your own as human shields, so when the Israelis are forced to shoot back in self-defense, you can say, see what the Israelis did. Did the Israelis send 200 Australians home from vacation in Bali in body bags, or did radical Muslims? Did the Israelis butcher 350,000 Christians in East Timor, or did the Muslims? Are the Israelis responsible for the death of 120,000 Christians in the southern Philippines, or are the Muslims? Are the Israelis responsible for the genocide of 3.4 million Christians over a 14-year period in Sudan and Darfur, or are the Muslims? Did the Israelis perpetrate the September 11th attacks in New York, or did the Muslims? Did the Israelis burn and blow up buses and tube trains in London, or did radical Muslims? Did the Israelis carry out the Bradford riots, or did radical Muslims? Did the Israelis carry out the Paris riots, or did radical Muslims? Did the Israelis riot in Sydney, Australia, or did radical Muslims? Did Israelis attack the hospitals and hotels in Mumbai, India, or did radical Muslims? And on and on and on, shooting four-year-old children dead in front of their parents in Beslan in Chechnya. If Israel didn't exist, we would have the same problem, jihad. Moderate Muslims who want peace and progress for their people would still be being killed and assassinated by Hamas, by the Muslim Brotherhood, by Al-Qaeda, by Boko Haram, and by others of the same ilk. So it goes. Yet when anyone, especially Israel, stands up to protect their civilian population, forced in self-defense to shoot back. The world is supposed to be up in arms. The aggressor becomes the victim. This is an outrage. I'm disgusted and appalled by seeing those dead children in Gaza when the Israelis shoot back. But their blood is not on the hands of the Israelis. Their blood is on the hands of Hamas and their supporters. That's the reality. No government is perfect. In fact, no government is even righteous. Not until Jesus returns and the government is upon his shoulder do I expect to see real justice on this planet. But right is right, fair is fair, and truth is truth. Let's tell the truth. The truth of the matter is that from May 1948 until June 1967, Gaza, the West Bank, and East Jerusalem, as well as the Golan Heights, were all in the hands of Arab Muslims. If the Arab Muslim world wanted a second Palestinian Arab Muslim state, in addition to the one they already have in Jordan, why didn't they create one when they had 20 years nearly to do so. They had nearly 20 years to do so, but they saw no need for one. In 1968, Yasser Arafat said Jordan is Palestine. King Hussein of Jordan in 1970 said Jordan is Palestine. A two-state solution, we've always had one. 
Well, what about the Palestinian refugees? Most of those refugees came from Jordan in Black September. When Arafat tried on Jordan, what he's later tried on Israel, the Jordanians drove them into refugee camps in Lebanon in self-defense. King Hussein of Jordan killed between 15 and 18,000 Palestinian Arab Muslims in 12 days, September of 1970, Black September. King Faisal of Iraq was displaced by the Ba'ath Party, said Israel's for the Jews. King Musharraf of Saudi Arabia originally said Israel's for the Jews. The British government, at the mandate with the League of Nations, said Israel was for the Jews. Everybody agreed Jordan was Palestine. But somehow in the 1970s, the tooth fairy came with a magic wand, and people who went to bed Jordanians woke up Palestinians. The whole thing is a nonsense. The suffering of those people is not the fault of Israel. According to the World Health Organization of the UN, the standard of living in terms of everything from infant mortality to longevity to unemployment improved under the Israelis in Gaza 370% above what it had been under Nasser and the Muslim government of Egypt at that time, and improved 320% on the West Bank. Their standard of living went up. Infant mortality, longevity, employment, all of these things improved for the Arabs in those territories under the Israelis compared to what it had been. Once the Israelis leave, it degenerates again, and they blame the Israelis. The Israelis didn't tell the Arabs to leave in 1948. They told them to stay. The United Arab Command told them to leave, but all of a sudden it's Israel's fault. Israel had nothing to do with Black September, those refugees who were driven into Lebanon. But all of a sudden, it's Israel's fault. Not that I blame the Jordanians at all. They knew what Arafat was. The whole thing is a pack of malicious lies. You look at what took place in Kuwait in 1991, there were pogroms by the Kuwaitis against the Palestinian Arabs who lived there. There's never been any nation Palestine. They've never existed. Palestine is simply the Latinization of the word Philistine, who are Indo-European people that haven't existed in two and a half thousand years. There's no such thing as an ethnic Palestinian. These people are simply Arabs. Yasser Arafat was born in Egypt, educated in Egypt, served in the Egyptian army. Most of the people who live there are the grandchildren and great-grandchildren of people who immigrated illegally under the British from places like Tunisia for a better life under the British and the Jews than they were having in Muslim Arab countries. This whole thing is a nonsense. The indigenous Arabs have never came from there, Arabs come from Arabia. The Bedouins who have lived there for a long time were at peace with the Jews, and most of them still are. So are the Jewsies. So are the Christian Arabs, by and large. The Arab population of Israel has a higher level of income and social position, education, and political freedom than you'll find in most Arab Muslim countries. And the human rights record of Israel is the best in the Middle East. What happens to Christians in Iran, in Saudi Arabia, in Syria? What happens to Christians at the hands of Hezbollah or Hamas? The Israelis protect their Arab civilian Christian population. The women's rights record, the human rights record, the rights of Christians, the best in the Middle East is Israel, by far the best. Speaking as a Christian, I thank God there's at least one country in the Middle East that protects the human rights and religious freedom of Arab Christians, and that's Israel. Yet they're the one, hypocritically, so many people want to bully and target simply for fighting for the right to exist in their own indigenous God-given land, which the archaeological record proves that they are the indigenous people to say nothing of the scriptures and history. I'm not against Arabs living in peace with Jews. I think they could prosper living in peace with Jews. But you cannot live in peace with radical Islam. 
Radical Islam cannot even live at peace with moderate Muslims. Look what they're doing in Syria. Islam cannot live at peace with itself. One and a half million Muslims were killed by other Muslims in the war between Iran and Iraq, Sunni against Shia. These fundamentalist Muslims cannot live at peace with themselves. You hear their appeal. First the Saturday people, then the Sunday people. First we'll murder the Jews, then we'll murder the Christians. It's jihad. And I thank God that Israel is standing against the jihad. Mark my words. A time will come when Rotterdam, Holland, Paris, France, Birmingham, England, London, England, the capitals of Europe will have to defend themselves from radical Islam in the same way the Israelis are doing it today. It's only a matter of time. May the Lord have mercy. And may many Arab Muslims come to faith in Jesus and many Jews. God bless.